Hi, my name is Jan Naklas. I'm a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Intelligence. In our lab, we study learning and plasticity based on the processing of visual information in the brain. What makes this field so captivating is our ability to meticulously control every aspect of visual input thanks to showing images on monitor screens. Luckily for us, the visual system belongs to the most extensively studied circuits in neuroscience. And in this four-part series, I will give you a sneak peek into what we know so far about the visual system. Vision is one of the basic senses that we use every day. But have you ever wondered how we see and make sense of our surroundings? Based on visual input, we learn, make decisions and experience the world around us. We owe this to the entire visual system, including the eyes and the various brain structures that process this information. I have crafted this series of videos, each delving into a distinct state of visual information processing. This journey is a step-by-step -step exploration tailored to biology and neuroscience enthusiasts eager to deepen their understanding. My goal is to give you a clear overview of the essential concepts in visual neuroscience. I know how overwhelming it can be to grasp new topics, so think of it as a series of your go-to guide to understanding how your visual system works. I need to mention that most of the pioneering work in visual neuroscience has been conducted in monkeys, cats, ferrets and recently mice. That's why I'll be referring not only to the human visual system but also to other animals. Alright, so what exactly happens when you look at something? You see, when we gaze at an object, we're able to see it because it reflects light. Some other, like computer screens, emit light. And light is an electromagnetic radiation of which we see only a small spectrum called the visible light. Different wavelengths correspond to different perceived colors. This light that is reflected or emitted by the object embarks on a journey through different parts of our eye. It passes through the cornea and enters the pupil, continues through the lens, which focuses the light, and finally reaches the crucial destination, the retina. The retina is the main character of this episode. Did you know that the retina is already a part of our central nervous system? So eyes really are windows to the soul, if by soul you mean the brain. In this video, I will talk in detail about the retina, but before that, let's think about a bigger picture. Animals, just like humans, use their vision to explore and thrive in all kinds of environments. Imagine a bird gracefully soaring through the sky, its eyes scanning the landscape for potential prey. Or picture a goat with its funky rectangular pupils, perfectly designed to spot any lurking predators on the horizon. You see, the animals have a huge variety of eyes that are tailor-made for their specific habitats. Let's take a peek into the world of a tiny mouse, for instance. This is how the world looks from a mouse perspective. Now, if we zoom in and examine its retina, we will discover an array of photoreceptors, which we will explore in more detail in this video. But these photoreceptors are strategically distributed to capture and transmit valuable information about their surroundings. On the upper part of the retina, where the mouse observes the ground, it has many more green-sensitive photoreceptors. That makes sense, right? After all, the ground is covered by lush green grass. On the lower part, where the sky comes into view, there are a bunch of UV-sensitive photoreceptors. Why? Well, because the sunlight contains UV light. So you see, already the eyes of animals are adapted to extract the most important information in their natural environment. Now, why did I say that the dorsal part observes the ground and the ventral part observes the sky? Well, because our eye first collapses the three-dimensional world into an inverted two-dimensional projection on the surface of our retina. In a way, the world turns upside down for the retina. As I mentioned, the retina is a part of our central nervous system, therefore it contains nerve cells. It's made up of three layers with cell bodies and two layers filled with fibers and synapses. When the light reaches the retina, it hits… not the ganglion cells? Well, no, it's a big paradox in vertebrates. Their retina is inverted. It means that the light first goes to the outermost layer, targeting photoreceptors. Later, the information from photoreceptors is relayed to the middle layer, featuring horizontal, bipolar and amacrine cells, and finally it is passed on to the inner layer with the retinal ganglion cells. 
Don't you think it's weird that the light goes all the way to the back to then return? Why would we have such a peculiar design of the retina? While we don't have all the answers yet, there are a couple of intriguing hypotheses. One possibility suggests that having the photoreceptors on the outermost layer allows us to fit more of them, potentially enhancing the acuity of vision, so how sharp we see. By the way, this is not the case for invertebrates, so for example octopuses don't have this inverted retinal design. Let's delve into the world of photoreceptors. In most vertebrates, including humans, we have two main types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. These two types are distinct in several ways. First, let's talk about their appearance. As their name suggests, their outer segments resemble rods and cones, respectively. They have unique morphologies that contribute to their specialized functions. Now, here is where it gets interesting. Rods and cones have different sensitivities to light. Rods are the true superheroes of low light conditions, as they are incredibly sensitive. They come to the rescue when the world around us dims, enabling us to see in the dark. However, as the light level increases, rods become overwhelmed and stop responding effectively. On the other hand, cones are less sensitive to light, requiring brighter illumination to kick into action. That's why cones take the lead during daylight hours, providing us with clear vision. In humans and other primates, we have a single type of rod and three types of cones, each containing a different photopigment. These types, often termed blue, green and red cones, are more accurately described as short, medium and long wavelength cones due to their spectral sensitivities. Cones enable our color vision by responding to light of different wavelengths. In fact, individual cones, like rods, are entirely colorblind. They respond only based on the number of photons they capture. Instead, Color perception emerges later in the visual pathway by comparing the activity across three classes of cones. So one type alone does not provide color vision, it's only combining multiple allows the true color vision. It's like computer screens that use RGB spectrum or printers using CMYK to produce a wide range of colors from just a few primary ones. While cones enjoy the glory of color, rods play a supporting role in dim light. They have little involvement in color vision, which explains why our world appears less colorful when illumination is scarce. This dual nature of photoreceptors in low and high light conditions is called the duplex theory of vision. Now let's talk numbers and distribution. The human retina has about 100 million rods and only 6 million cones. However, they are not evenly scattered throughout. In the focal point of our sharpest vision lies the fovea. It's a region densely packed with cones. In cats, the equivalent of fovea is called area centralis, while mice don't have a fovea, but they have a higher number of photoreceptors in the central part of the retina. Just a few millimeters beyond the fovea, the concentration of cones significantly decreases, and as we venture towards the outer edges of the retina, the photoreceptors become larger and more spaced out, adapting to the peripheral visual field. So you see, the intricate world of photoreceptors holds the key to our vision, color perception and adaptability to different light conditions. It's truly remarkable how these specialized cells work together to shape our visual experience. Let's take an even closer look at the fovea. When we fix our gaze on an object, our eyes align to center it within our field of view. That's precisely where the fovea resides and it's the epicenter of our sharpest vision. We perceive images as a constant image, but we actually scan the most important details with our fovea. This movement of eyes is called saccades. We don't perceive the image with distinct resolution because our brain pieces it together when the visual information is processed in later stages. Within this fovea, the density of photoreceptors, bipolar cells and ganglion cells reaches the peak. But there is a twist. Right at the center of the fovea, we find the foveola. Here, cells are pushed aside to minimize light scattering before it reaches the photoreceptors. This ingenious adaptation ensures that the incoming light hits the photoreceptors with maximum precision and less scattering. 
Now that we understand the anatomy of the retina, let's take a closer look at the physiology. Here's how it all unfolds. In the absence of light, photoreceptors are in a depolarized state and release a neurotransmitter called glutamate at their synaptic terminals. Once light reaches the photoreceptors, a process called phototransduction kicks into gear. The outer segments of photoreceptors contain unique light-absorbing photopigments which differ between rods and cones. For instance, cones contain a pigment called rhodopsin. These pigments molecules have the ability to absorb photons, triggering a cascade of events. When photons are absorbed, channels in the cell membrane close, leading to membrane hyperpolarization. This process reduces the release of glutamate, effectively acting as a signal that the light stimulus is present. So in simple terms, photoreceptors in bright regions become hyperpolarized, while those in darker regions remain depolarized. Now, let's meet the next set of players in our visual system bipolar cells. These cells receive information from the photoreceptors and act as intermediaries connecting various neuron types within the retina. They play a crucial role in performing the initial elementary operations in our visual system. One of the primary functions of bipolar cells is to establish a link between the outer and inner layers of the retina. Studies in mice have revealed that there are more than 10 types of bipolar cells, each with distinct characteristics such as chromatic preference, polarity and kinetics. These bipolar cells transmit signals by releasing glutamate onto amacrine cells and retinal ganglion cells. It's worth noting that neither photoreceptors nor bipolar cells generate action potentials. Instead, they communicate using graded membrane potentials. The release of glutamate by bipolar cells occurs through a specialized structure called the ribbon synapse. Another two types of neurons in the retina are horizontal and already mentioned amacrine cells. Horizontal cells play a crucial role by providing negative feedback to photoreceptors. On the other hand, amacrine cells inhibit the activity of cells they connect with. Visual information is passed from the photoreceptors through horizontal, bipolar and amacrine cells onto the retinal ganglion cells, in short RGCs. RGCs are a super important group of neurons in our retina, that's why we need to take a closer look at them. Each ganglion cell receives information from hundreds or even thousands of photoreceptors, which shapes their receptive fields. It's a super important term that we will talk about in every video, so you must understand it thoroughly. Think about photoreceptors as pixels. Neighboring pixels get summed up to so-called receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells. It's a small section of the entire image you see with your eyes. By focusing on this little section, RGCs can look for certain local features, such as differences in contrast, light intensity or edges, etc. The simplest receptive fields belong to the RGCs, and as we go further in the visual information processing pathway, the receptive fields become more and more complex. Retinal ganglion cells have very characteristic center surround receptive fields. So when light hits the center region of an on-cell receptive field, it starts firing action potentials like crazy, indicating a strong response. But here's a twist. If the bright spot hits the surrounding region, the firing rate of a cell decreases. It's like the cell prefers the center over the edges. On the flip side, for an off-cell, it's the complete opposite. The strongest response happens when there is a dark spot in a bright surrounding. This fancy feature of ganglion cells helps them to pick up on edges and objects with high contrast. That's because you can detect things the easiest if there is a high contrast, such as a dark predator buried against the bright sky. But wait, there is more. RGCs not only care about space, but they also pay attention to time. They are like speedy little detectors. Different types of RGCs have different response patterns. You've got the transient ones that go wild with bursts of spikes right when the stimulus starts and then they calm down. On the other hand, you've got the sustained ones that keep firing at a steady rate for several seconds. It's like some cells are all about quick bursts while others like to keep the party going for a little bit longer. By blending information about space and time, RGCs are exceptionally good at spotting moving objects. 
Think about it. For a little mouse, being able to quickly detect a potential predator, like an owl swooping down, is a matter of survival. So this information has to be analyzed very quickly and early in the visual processing. And it's not just the mouse. Even the owl itself relies on this feature to locate its prey. When there is a moving object in view, it sets off a party among the ganglion cells near the edges of that object's image. They get super excited. You see, the outline of the object becomes super important for us to figure out its shape and identify what it is. It's like our retinas have this special radar for anything on the move. Now here's the bottom line. The retina already does some serious work to extract a palette of details from the visual scene. In other words, the retina performs low-level visual processing before this information even reaches the visual system in our brain. These clever cells in the retina pick up on different aspects of visual stimuli like color, contrast, brightness, shape and size and help us make sense of the world around us and guide our behavior. The visual information continues its journey when the axons of ganglion cells team up and form something called the optic nerve. It's like a super highway of visual information. This nerve exits the eye through a spot called the optic disc. Right at the optic disc, we have something what's known as the blind spot. Yep, you heard it right. There is a tiny spot in our visual field where there is no photoreceptors, so we can't see anything. It's like a little gap in our vision. We don't normally see it as we move our eyes in saccades, so this gap cancels out eventually. But fear not, because the journey continues. From the optic disc, the optic nerve cruises through the orbit, makes its way through the optic canal and reaches the optic chiasm. This is where the optic fibers from both eyes come together and have a little rendezvous. Some of these fibers actually decide to cross over to the other side, and the proportion of crossing fibers varies between different species, but we will talk in the next video all about the intermediate steps in the visual information processing. In summary, our exploration today led us through the path of light as it navigates through the cornea, pupil and lens, ultimately reaching the retina, a vital component in the central nervous system. The retina's layered structure introduces us to photoreceptors, including rods and cones, in the outermost layer, each with distinct light sensitivities crucial for different lighting conditions. Dwelling deeper, we uncovered the inner layers, housing cells like bipolar, horizontal, amacrine and retinal ganglion cells. Importantly, RGCs exhibit center surround receptive fields, a key mechanism in perceiving contrast and motion. Our visual journey concludes as the axons of RGCs unite to form the optic nerve, making their exit through the optic disc, the fibers from both eyes continue their journey, converging at the optic chiasm. This summarizes the first stage of visual information processing in the eye. That's it for today, folks. I hope that this video leaves you excited about the visual system and makes you want to learn more. And there is more to come, so stay tuned. See you next time. Bye.